I'm going to welcome everyone to the 2021 seventh annual Rene Roy Akshela Lecture in Health Equity, presented by Dr. Donald Warren. I'm Jay Magaziner, Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health in the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland. Before we begin the lecture, I have a few housekeeping details to review with you. All session attendees will be muted throughout the session and your cameras will be remain in the off position. We have a lot of time at the end of the session for questions. If you want to ask a question, please use either the chat function or preferably the Q and a function. I'll be monitoring those and will um, attempt to um, get to some of the questions, um, depending on how much time there is after Dr. Warren speaks. The lecture will be recorded and you will be able to gain access to it from the EPH Epidemiology and Public Health website in a few days. And finally, if you would like CME credits for attending this session and you are a physician, please click the link in the chat box to submit your request. For continuing education unit credits in social work, click the CEU link if you have not already registered. Now, it is my great pleasure to say a few words about this unique lecture and to introduce Dr. Warren. This lecture is supported by a generous gift from the family of the late Dr. Renee Royak Shaler. Dr. Royak Shaler was a behavioral scientist whose research focused on health disparities. Until her sudden death in 2011, she also directed our Master of Public Health program in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health and spearheaded the formation of our dual degree programs with all of the professional school programs on this campus. And she taught students in the MPH, Master of Science and PhD programs. Renee's family established this lecture to honor her memory and legacy in the department and her abiding commitment to health equity and the elimination of disparities across the continuum of cancer care. I want to thank our program in health equity and population health for organizing this annual lecture and for bringing together researchers and students to engage with Dr. Warren. In light of the very pressing issues in health equity today, it is especially fitting that this year's Rene Royak Shaler Lecture in Health Equity is presented by Dr. Donald Warren. He is the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, as well as the Director of the Indians into Medicine, the Master of Public Health Program, and Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at the University of North Dakota. He also serves as the Senior Policy Advisor to the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board in Rapid City, South Dakota, is a member of the Oglala Lakata tribe from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and comes from a long line of traditional healers and medicine men. He received his medical degree from Stanford University School of Medicine and his MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. His work experience includes several years as a primary care physician with the Gila River Healthcare Corporation of, in Arizona, staff clinician with the National Institutes of Health, Indian Legal Program faculty with the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, Health Policy Research Director for the Intertribal Council of Arizona, Executive Director of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board and Chair of the Department of Public Health at North Dakota State University. His professional activities include memberships on the National Board of Trustees for the March of Dimes, 
the Health Disparities Subcommittee of the Advisory Committee to the Director of the Center for the Disease Control and Prevention and the Board of Directors of Pub Pub the Public Health Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Warren. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the, the kind introduction and I'm very honored to be a part of this lecture series uh, in uh, memory of such a, a wonderful uh, health equity advocate and academic. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, for the uh, students who are uh, participating and, and listening into the discussion, my focus will be on looking at the impact of unresolved trauma on American Indian health equity. And I think that when we think about health equity, we also have to recognize that there's a lot of variability across populations. And one size does not fit all, as we know, when we're talking about health services, and certainly strategies to address health equity need to reflect the unique nature of various populations that we are working with. So we'll be looking at the impact of unresolved trauma and historical trauma. Now, I am a family physician in addition to having training in public health. And I think when we consider uh, uh, the field of medicine, I think a, a lot of people, when they hear the word trauma, they think about uh, physical trauma. So, uh, so if you think about trauma from a physician's perspective, we might think of an emergency room and a trauma center. And certainly there is physical trauma. And unfortunately, we have disparities in physical trauma as well in terms of uh, higher rates of unintentional injuries. But really what we're talking about here is emotional and psychological trauma. And there's various definitions of these types of trauma, including one-time events that could include an accident or an injury, a death of someone close to you, loss of a relationship or a job, a humiliating experience, et cetera. It can be one-time emotional or psychological traumatic events. But we also have toxic stress that's ongoing and relentless stress that disproportionately affects many impoverished communities. And certainly just living in poverty is a stressor in and of itself. But also many populations are exposed to higher rates of violence, including domestic violence. We have a challenge with social isolation, particularly during the pandemic. One of our recommendations, of course, has been social uh, distancing. I wish we never called it that. I wish we called it physical distancing, not social distancing, because in truth, we need social connectedness now more than ever. But another ongoing toxic stressor is chronic illness or chronic pain. And for the populations that I work with, American Indian uh, populations in the Northern Plains, we have higher rates of poverty, higher rates of domestic violence, and certainly higher rates of chronic illness that are leading to high levels of toxic stress. And then at the societal level, unfortunately, we are not beyond racism. That still is a part of American society, I wish that were not the case, but as we've seen just in recent events, looking at the, the news and current events, we see that that is still here. Another consideration is childhood trauma. And I'm sure many people have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study or the ACE study, but we have to look at it even beyond that and look further upstream in terms of what's causing different types of trauma in various populations. And for indigenous communities, some of the areas that are unique include colonization and just the loss of land, loss of language, loss of culture, ongoing discrimination and marginalization is a big challenge, including exclusion and racism. So in terms of exclusion, uh, just to put this into context, when we look at all of the medical schools in the nation, there are zero medical school deans who are American Indian, zero. And there's only two of us who are associate deans. So I am 50% of the American Indian associate deans at medical schools. And that's not a pat on the back. That's actually an indictment on the field, recognizing that we have a lot of work to do to promote more inclusion across populations, particularly indigenous populations. So I put a lot of time and uh, study into trying to understand the impact of trauma on chronic disease disparities. And one of our symbols in the Lakota, traditional Lakota way and many uh, tribal traditions is the idea of a medicine wheel or, or a sacred hoop. And what this shows is four directions, east, north, west, and south. And they're, each of the, those are connected by a circle. So we recognize that these things are all interconnected. And to be healthy, we have to be in balance, spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. 
But when we think about trauma, of course, it can be physical trauma. There can be uh, psychological and emotional trauma. But for the indigenous populations, we have to be, also have to be cognizant of spiritual trauma. And the idea of loss of land is not just about uh, occupying space. It's about that deep rooted cultural and spiritual connectedness to the land. And to put this in perspective, I'm a thousandth generation American, you know, the, and, and many people have not had their families here nearly that long. But the land is literally the dust of, of my ancestors, and it's the building blocks of future generations. So that connectedness to place is very deep rooted for indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this place. So loss of land and loss of uh, territory, loss of food systems, that all has an impact on subsequent health disparities. So let's start this uh, discussion really with a, a discussion related to uh, wording and nomenclature. What is the terminology? So according to the US Census and the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, for the, the federal government, there are several races and ethnicities. And the race is American Indian and Alaska Native. So on the census, we can self-identify as American Indian and Alaska Native. And the reason that Alaska Natives are separated out from American Indians is that not all indigenous people in Alaska are American Indian. So for example, the Inuit populations in Northern Alaska also exist in Northern Siberia, Northern Canada, and Greenland. So the Inuits are Alaska Natives, but they are not American Indian. They're more of a circumpolar uh, population. The Athabascan groups in central Alaska are American Indian culturally. Uh, they are also very closely linked to the Dene populations in Canada, as well as Navajo and Apache populations in the southwestern part of the United States. But if you look at the Aleutian populations in the Aleutian Island chain in the North Pacific, culturally the Aleutian people are much more similar to Pacific Islanders than they are American Indians because they are Pacific Islanders. They just have to be, happen to be in the Northern Pacific. So that's why we have American Indian and Alaskan Native. And within that population, we have a, a unique political status of enrolled tribal member. So for those of us who are enrolled in our tribes, basically we're a citizen of our tribal nation, but not all self-identified American Indians and Alaskan Natives are enrolled in their tribe. So this has an impact when we're looking at data sets. If you look at census data, you will look at all self-identified American Indians and Alaska Natives. But if you are looking for people who are eligible for Indian Health Service, so you look at Indian Health Service data, that's the enrolled tribal members. So it's important to understand these designations from a public health perspective and an epidemiological perspective, because that has an impact on our denominator, right? Who is included within the data set? So American Indian Alaska Native is a census data enrolled tribal members are typically in the Indian Health Service data. So we've also heard the term Native American that's used quite often interchangeably with American Indian, but Native American is actually legally defined. There was the Native American Programs Act of 1974, NAPA, Native American Programs Act, and it defines Native Americans as American Indians and Alaska Natives, but also Native Hawaiians and indigenous people of the U.S. Pacific territories. So the Chamorro indigenous people of Guam and uh, Samoans in American Samoa, they are all Native Americans from the legal definition. So I tend not to use those terms interchangeably. If I'm talking about all of those indigenous groups, I'm talking about Native Americans, but typically uh, my work is with American Indian populations here in the Dakotas. But we have indigenous peoples worldwide. The indigenous peoples are the original inhabitants of various parts of the world. All over the globe, we have the indigenous or first peoples who lived in these regions. So I've been using the term indigenous more frequently because one of the things that we observe is that there are very similar health disparity and health equity challenges across indigenous populations, even if they are in different parts of the world. So at UND, the University of North Dakota, we have a master of public health that includes a specialization in indigenous health, as well as a new PhD in indigenous health. And I'll talk about those programs in just a little bit. So we have indigenous peoples across North America and where I'm from, 
in the Northern Plains, we have a lot of cultural similarities, but it's important to acknowledge that there are hundreds of tribes and hundreds of cultures. And just like we see a great deal of uh, diversity in continents like Europe, for example, Scandinavians are very different than Sicilians, right? Different language, different behaviors, different cultures, different appearances. We see the same uh, type of disparity or, or uh, same type of uh, diversity across indigenous peoples as well. So there's not a single indigenous culture or language. I'm very proud of my university. Uh, just this last year, we formally adopted a land acknowledgement. So very briefly, today, the University of North Dakota rests on the ancestral lands of the Pembina and Red Lake bands of Ojibwe and the Dakota Oyate, presently existing as composite parts of the Red Lake, Turtle Mountain, White Earth bands, and the Dakota tribes of Minnesota and North Dakota. We acknowledge the people who resided here for generations and recognize that the spirit of the Ojibwe and Oyate people permeates this land. As a university community, we will continue to build upon our relations with the First Nations of the state of North Dakota, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation, Sisseton, Wapaton, Oyate Nation, Spirit Lake Nation, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. And even at the uh, University of Maryland, right there in Baltimore, you are on Indigenous land. And it would be wonderful to consider, if it hasn't been done already, just to have a land acknowledgement, to acknowledge the original people of areas like Baltimore and other parts of Maryland. So most American Indians and Alaska Natives live in the western half of the United States. And there's now only seven states that have at least 3% American Indian or Alaska Native population. That includes Alaska, Montana, North Dakota, where I work, South Dakota, where I am from, but also Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. And as you can see in the western half of the United States, there are relatively few American Indians left, including in the state of Maryland. There's relatively few American Indians left. There's a pocket of population because the headquarters of the Indian Health Service happens to be in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, but uh, they're typically American Indians from other parts of the country who wind up going to work in Rockville, but relatively few American Indians left in the western half of the United States. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that colonization started in the Northeast of what is now the United States. And if the colonization had occurred uh, beginning in the West, the map would be reversed. And we'd have more indigenous people in the Eastern half of the US. But colonization started in the East and moved West. And as a result, many of the tribal nations in the Eastern half of the United States were, were really just devastated by colonization. And this is unique and it does have intergenerational and long-term impacts in terms of historical trauma and subsequent health disparities. So that's why we, we need to think of things like indigenous health as its own academic discipline because the history is so unique and the health outcomes are common across many indigenous populations, not just here in the United States. So this is the region where I am from long before there were state lines drawn on the map our people existed here. So I am Lakota, originally from what is now the western half of now North Dakota and South Dakota. And other people within my tribal group include the Nakota or Assiniboine in further north and the Dakota people who were further east. So the reason this became the Dakota Territory and the reason I work at the University of North Dakota is that colonization came from the east. So they encountered the Dakota people first. So I always like to say if colonization had come from the West, they would have encountered the Lakota people. This would have been the Lakota territory and I would work at UNL instead of UND. <coughs> Excuse me, but colonization came from the East. So they encountered the D Dakotas first. The red circle is Grand Forks where University of North Dakota is located. And you can see relative to where that is uh, located compared to Minneapolis and what is now Minnesota. So I'm frequently asked, why is it that you work at UND? You know, there's a lot of other medical schools and public health programs across the nation and North Dakota is very cold and, and all those types of considerations. But the reason I am here is that it is the uh, homelands of my people. And the reason it is called Grand Forks, North Dakota, is that it is the confluence of the Red Lake River heading west and the Red River heading north. So this was actually a gathering point for my people historically. 
And long before there were highways, we had the riverways that we used for transportation. So people could get in their canoes and actually convene along the rivers. So every time I cross over the bridge at Grand Forks, I always imagined to myself how beautiful that must have looked with thousands of teepees and tens of thousands of people gathered in the Red River Valley. And then the Red River flows north through what is now Winnipeg. And in the city of Winnipeg, it, uh, uh, the Red River meets the Assiniboine or the Nakota River, and it's an area called the Forks, another beautiful area. So this entire region was a gathering point for my people. So you can see that's North Dakota, South Dakota, and then just to, to the east is Minnesota. And it's really remarkable, the, the vast majority of people who live in Minnesota have no idea what the word Minnesota actually means. And Minnesota actually comes from two Dakota words. Mani means water and Shota means cloudy or smoky. So in the spring and in the fall, when it appears that the clouds are rising off of the water, that is a Mani Shota. So this, this whole region was called Mani Shota Makoche, or the land of the cloudy water. So it was a descriptive term, very beautiful term, but now it's just called Minnesota. So every time you say the word Minneapolis, pat yourself on the back, you're being bilingual. In this case, you're saying water city in Dakota Greek. Mani is water in Dakota, and polis is city in Greek. So Minneapolis is water city in Dakota Greek. So little known facts, but this is the, the region where I am from. So let's look at uh, this in historical context and really try to understand in greater depth, what is the impact of colonization on indigenous health? Well, the, the 13 colonies were just devastating to the Northeastern tribes. And you may have heard of Amherst, Massachusetts and Amherst College. Uh, he's that's named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst, who was a colonial governor uh, during this time frame, and he's well known in Indian country because he is the individual who ordered the distribution of blankets from a smallpox hospital to the northeastern tribes with the purpose of killing them. So it's remarkable we're dealing with a worldwide pandemic right now, but smallpox as a pandemic was actually used in colonial warfare to kill indigenous peoples of what is now the United States. So this was very effective. It's one of the reasons why so many of the tribes were just completely wiped out was the purposeful spread of smallpox by our own colonial government. So you can Google uh, Amherst and smallpox and you can actually find the letter that he wrote ordering the distribution. So this is in the pen of Lord Jeffrey Amherst. And I know it's in cursive and difficult to read, but he says, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate or get rid of this exorable or horrible race. Extirpate this exorable race. I should be very glad your scheme for hunting them down by dogs could take effect. So how do we deal with this now? Well, we actually honor Jeffrey Amherst, right? There's a city named after him. There are colleges named after him. And what we need to recognize is that this is our earliest documented case of bioterrorism. But in this case, it's from the colonial government to the indigenous peoples of the Northeast United States, purposeful murder of indigenous peoples. So we have to be cognizant of this. And I don't tell these stories to make anyone feel bad. That's not the purpose. But if we are ever going to get to equity, we have to walk through truth, even when it's unpleasant, even when it's uncomfortable. So we have to understand the truth of history to get to equity. And I love the theme of this lecture series of being focused on health equity. So we have to understand the truth. Now, the Southeastern tribes had another experience. In 1830, there was a law called the Indian Removal Act. And it's more colloquially known as the Trail of Tears. You may have heard of that. And that's when tribes in the Southeast were removed from their homelands and put into what is now Oklahoma. So as a result of this, many of the tribal members refused to leave their homelands. I don't blame them, it's where they're from. Well, some of the tribal members were removed to Oklahoma. So that's why we have this interesting dynamic now where we have Seminoles in Florida and Seminoles in Oklahoma. Cherokees in North Carolina, Cherokees in Oklahoma, Choctaws in Mississippi, Choctaws in Oklahoma. So you get the idea. 
So of the 38 federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, only four of them are originally from Oklahoma. The rest were removed from other parts of the country. And again, as indigenous peoples, we have a deeply rooted spiritual connection, religious connection, meaningful connection to the earth, to place, and to our historical homelands. The discovery of gold was devastating for the California tribes. There was a time in history when there was a bounty. You could actually kill American Indians for a bounty, uh, either through warfare or to make way for the gold rush. And this happened uh, throughout the state of California, and many of the tribes in California were devastated as a result. So this is the outcome. I had shown you the map of state uh, concentrations of population. This is uh, the indigenous population concentration by county in the United States. And this is based on the 2010 census, so we're still waiting for the results of 2020 census. But you can see that we're concentrated in the western half of the U.S. Again, those seven states of Alaska, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. And then there's huge segments of the nation, including Maryland, in which there are very few American Indians left. But there's a reason for this, and I've only touched on a, just a brief handful of examples of why uh, we, our people were moved or out of their homelands or uh, essentially eliminated. So th this is part of our history and it has an ongoing intergenerational impact. So we need to recognize that there was a genocide in the United States of America. And it's estimated that at the time of contact, there were probably about 20 million indigenous people in North America. Of that number, probably about 5 million in what is now the United States. By, by the year 1900, there were less than 200,000. So from over 5 million to 200,000, that's almost a complete genocide. And what's fascinating, you may have seen in the news just this week, that President Biden formally acknowledged the Armenian genocide. And that's wonderful. That should be done. But I think it's also important to acknowledge the American genocide. This is the truth of history. Again, not to make anyone feel bad, that's not the purpose, but this is the truth and we want to get to equity. So we have to understand truth if we're going to find the right solutions. So the good news is by 2010, there were 5.2 million self-identified American Indians and Alaska Natives in the US Census. So again, the terminology, American Indian and Alaska Native is self-identified racial designation on the census, whereas enrolled tribal member is a different political designation. I, I hope that makes sense. So I've done a lot of research in recent years trying to understand the intergenerational basis for chronic disease disparities among American Indians and Alaska Natives. And I've talked about historical trauma and the genocide that has occurred right here in the United States. In addition to that, we also had forced boarding school participation. And this is common across many indigenous populations. We had boarding schools in the US as well as in Australia for Aboriginal children. There were, were residential schools in Canada. And uh, quite often it was forced participation. So when the tribes were removed from their homelands and put onto reservations, they lost their traditional food systems. They lost their food sovereignty. So they became dependent on federal government programs for food. So what the families were told in many cases is either give up your children to go to boarding school or we will withhold your rations. So basically the choice is give up your children or starve to death. That was federal policy. And this is not ancient history. My own mother is a survivor of boarding schools. And unfortunately there's just terrible stories and documentation of abuse and neglect and uh, terrible treatment of the children who were taken away to boarding schools. This is a picture of the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It's the graveyard right next to the school. And most of these uh, Indian boarding schools have a huge graveyard right next to them. And the question is, why were so many children dying at such an unnatural rate? We know that there were things like outbreaks of tuberculosis, but that does not answer the full extent of why there was so much excess death. And my question is, what about the survivors? What is the impact on the children when they have so many of their friends and classmates dying and suffering while they are at boarding school? So this is a part of historical trauma. And this is a famous picture of the children at Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The motto of the school was kill the Indian, save the man. 
And I, I look at these faces and I see my own children. I see nieces and nephews. I see community members, but I don't see a lot of smiles. I see a lot of sadness. I see a lot of anger. I see a lot of isolation and loss. And these were terrible experiences. These were concentration camps for children. And it happened right here in the United States. And these things are not very well addressed in our history books, are they? Most people aren't aware of this history, but it has an impact, obviously, on the health of populations. And that can be an intergenerational impact. Here's a very famous picture of a Navajo young man from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So on the left, that's when he entered boarding school in Carlisle then three years later. And this was seen as a success story. Look, we killed the Indian and saved the man, you know, basically get rid of the culture. But what does that do to self-esteem? And when people left Carlisle and other boarding schools to go uh, into general society, were they accepted? Even if they were, if they had their hair cut and, and went to boarding school, does that mean that the general society still accepted them? No. And then they were also not accepted going back home either. So this is really lost generation of uh, social isolation and lack of connectedness. And this is really unique to indigenous peoples in terms of this. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of epigenetics and how stressful circumstances can actually alter DNA. And in animal models, we've seen changes to DNA that can be passed from one generation to the next. I really believe that epigenetics will provide a scientific platform to better understand historical trauma. So that's part of the research focus moving forward that we're doing at University of North Dakota. So beyond the boarding schools, we also have other uh, exposures to stressors, including WIC, the Women, Infants and Children program. I'm sure you're familiar with that. When I was a full-time clinician, now 20 to 25 years ago, the WIC program on the reservations where I worked, they were basically baby formula distribution centers, just handing out baby formula. And we know that as a population, formula-fed babies have higher rates of adult diabetes than breastfed babies. And the WIC programs were inadvertently causing lower rates of breastfeeding and higher rates of formula feeding. They made great improvements in recent decades trying to promote more breastfeeding, but damage has been done to populations. The FDPIR is the food distribution program on Indian reservations. It's the commodity food program. It's a USDA sponsored food program. So now when we think of traditional American Indian food, a lot of people think of fry bread, right? Well, actually fry bread is not a traditional American Indian food. None of the tribes ever fried dough. The origin of fry bread is actually in the commodity food program. The picture of the elder on the right, you can see she's using commodity flour and commodity shortening from the USDA to create fry bread. And fry bread is essentially poison, right? It's the trans fats, it's the hypersaturated vegetable shortening with enriched flour, and I don't know why it's called enriched, basically all the nutrients are taken out and all that's left behind is the starch. So the worst type of fat and the worst type of carbohydrate, and then that's what we call fry bread. So I always tell my relatives, you know, fry bread is not traditional food, at least it's not traditional American Indian food. If we wanna call it traditional food, let's call it traditional USDA food. And again, this is one area that's so unique to indigenous populations in that the food distribution program on Indian reservations doesn't apply to any other population. But I would wonder in your own public health curriculum, do you talk about that? Is there even discussion of the commodity food program and its impact on health disparities for some populations, particularly American Indian populations? So I think we just have not been included in the public health academics and dialogue and we need to have a better understanding of this, again, if we're going to find equitable solutions to the health disparities. So I grew up eating commodity foods. The beef and pork or some sort of spam-like meat product. Uh, there was a, a commodity cheese, so government cheese. I swear that could last on a, a shelf for a year because of all the preservatives. They had a, a grape juice that I think was just sugar water with purple food coloring. On the right, that big jar, that's a jar of pure corn syrup. And if you know about nutrition, you know corn syrup is basically a poison. And I know it's in very fine print, but it says, use in your baby formula. This is from the USDA telling moms, use this poison in your baby formula. It also says, use this on your pancakes and French toast. 
So this is a part of U.S. policy. This is a part of health policy, food policy, that has a very direct impact on chronic disease disparities. And this is not, you know, ancient history. I grew up eating this stuff. Uh, many of my uh, uh, contemporary uh, colleagues uh, uh, had the same experience. So this, is, again, is a part of our history that has a huge impact on health disparities, but it's not well understood or not well described, I would say. Um, also, I'm sure many of you are familiar with adverse childhood experiences or the ACE study, and we know that the more adversity someone faces during childhood, the worse their health status is as an adult. And we know that ACEs or adverse childhood experiences have long-lasting effects on health in terms of higher rates of diabetes, depression, suicide, heart disease, and cancer, higher rates of risk factors like smoking and addiction, and worsened life potential, lower graduation rates lower employment, lower income. So adverse childhood experiences have a huge impact on health outcomes for populations. And very pleased with the CDC, as was mentioned, I am on the advisory committee um, on health disparities for the CDC. And through the National Center on Injury, Injury Prevention, I'm so proud of what they've done that the ACE pyramid does not have just adverse childhood experiences at the base anymore. You can see that the base of this is now generational embodiment and historical trauma, which can lead to the social conditions and social determinants, which lead to a local context for higher risk for ACEs. So it's not just the behavior within an individual family, it's the entire community and it's those historical and other types of factors that lead to greater risk for ACEs in some populations. And then we know it has an impact on neurological development, social and cognitive development, health behavior, and then early onset of disease and early death. So I've done a lot of research in recent years looking at disparities and adverse childhood experiences among American Indians, but even more importantly, what is it that we can do about it? So the adversity does not stop at age 18, right? We still see adversity in adulthood and living with high rates of poverty is stressful. Living with racism is stressful. Living in communities where there's a lot of violence or addiction is stressful. And that leads to toxic stress and potentially uh, epigenetic mediated health disparities. The other issue is abused children grow up to have children, right? And what have they learned about parenting? So we have the next generation challenges of adversity. So I see this and I see a lot of reasons for intergenerational health disparities, but I also see a lot of areas for intervention. And that's our next step is to make sure that we're intervening. We've identified the risks for chronic disease disparities. Now we need to do something about it. So I was the co-principal investigator in what was called the South Dakota Health Survey. And we basically cut and pasted survey questions from other sources, including BRFAS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, we also did mental health screening, so not self-reported mental health challenges, but actual screening like PHQ-2 for depression, the GAD-2 for generalized anxiety disorder, Audit C for alcohol use disorder, and we included the ACE questionnaire, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And as this uh, wound up being very successful. We had over 50% response rate. We wound up having uh, over 8,200 surveys filled out, representing almost every county in South Dakota. And we had well over 500 American Indians participating in the South Dakota Health Survey. And I think we had a very representative sample. The American Indian population is much younger than the non-American Indian population. We have very high death rates, but we also have very high birth rates. And the result is our population is much younger. So the sample in the South Dakota Health Survey does reflect uh, what we see in census data and statistically significantly younger population for American Indians. And unfortunately, uh, social determinants of health were statistically significantly worse for American Indians when it comes to employment status, income, and educational attainment. Again, all independent risk factors for poor health. This slide is a little bit busy, but the, the three groups of columns the far right light blue column is the reservation based population. And this is for screening again. This is not just self report, but actually screening. We saw st statistically significant worse depression, anxiety and post traumatic stress in the populations who lived in Indian reservations in South Dakota. In terms of ACE disparities, each of the 10 domains for ACEs 
was statistically significantly worse for American Indians. And the ACE score is basically zero through 10, depending on the numbers of categories or domains of adverse childhood experiences. We had some subjects who had ACE scores of 10, meaning they had experienced all of these forms of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So just terrible in terms of outcomes and disparities. And not surprisingly, for the total ACE score, of course, was significantly worse for American Indians. And you can see for zero ACEs, 50% uh, of the non-Indian population had no adverse childhood experiences, only 17% of American Indians. But if you look at uh, four or more adverse childhood experiences, you can see it's about 32%, about a third of the American Indian population had four or more adverse childhood experiences compared to about 11% of the rest of the population. So just terrible disparities. So again, thinking about indigenous perspectives on trauma, I hope it's very clear that as indigenous peoples, we have a unique history, we have unique cultures, and we have a unique story. And we also have an academic discipline in public health that is indigenous health. And it's not adequately explored or offered through most public health programs. So we're trying to do something about that at University of North Dakota. But again, you can have physical trauma, you have psychological or emotional trauma, but you can also have spiritual trauma. And some of the uh, interventions that we are designing and implementing and evaluating include in the spiritual realm, what is the impact of prayer? What is the impact of reconnection with language and culture and ceremony and land? Even that spiritual connectedness to place is important. In the mental realm, you know, we've done meditation forever. We just had different terminology for it. And many of the principles in cognitive behavioral therapy are consistent with traditional American Indian medicinal practices. In many of our uh, tribal traditions, exercise and movement was a part of morning prayer. Quite often people would get up before sunrise and run east until they met the sunrise, had a prayer, then ran back home. So movement and exercise was a part of every day. And we know that movement is good even for mental health. And then in the social arena or mental or emotional arena, social connectedness is so important and, and counseling. And again, I think with the pandemic, I wish we had never used the word social distancing. It's physical distancing of six feet, but we need social connectedness. And I think that the social isolation and all of the other traumas from the pandemic are going to have long lasting impacts on vulnerable populations, unfortunately. So how do we focus on recovery? We have to look at health and healing from not just the physical perspective, but also emotional healing, spiritual healing, and mental healing. And there's an idea of recovery. Of course, we talk about recovery in terms of recovery from addiction. But I love that word recovery. The, the core, the root word is cover. And in many of our tribal traditions, particularly in the Northern Plains, having a blanket was part of a blanket ceremony. It was focused on healing. And when we think about covering and that sense of safety, that sense of warmth, that sense of belonging is how we uh, promote health and healing. And that's how we even honor people as they're going through their own growth and healing processes. So on the left, that's a nursing graduates at South Dakota State University getting a star quilt. These are some of my former students on the right at North Dakota State University getting star quilts upon graduating from public health school. I'm now director of the Indians into Medicine program. So these are MD graduates receiving their blankets. And it's part of that community recovery and trying to ensure that we have adequate numbers of health professionals from diverse populations, including American Indians. So we have a, a lot of social determinants of health, as we know. We've talked about those, and the outcomes are disparities in, in, and inequities across health, education, and income. So we have to address equity in a much more comprehensive way looking not just at the medical side and behavioral side, but also public health, health policy, history, culture, and really understanding these issues in a much more comprehensive manner. I think one of our challenges in public health academics is that we don't have enough American Indians and Alaska Natives in leadership positions. Again, I talked about having zero medical school deans. If you look at all of the schools and programs in public health, there's still only two American Indians who are directors, myself and my friend uh, um, uh, who works at East Carolina uh, University, Dr. Bell. He and I are the only American Indians to head public health programs in the nation. That's pathetic, right? That's an indictment on the field. 
And we don't know what we don't know. And I think that the homogeneity of leadership means that we're not even offering the right types of curriculum for populations that have unique histories. So I'm sure many of you have seen this image or similar images, looking at the differences between equality and equity. And in healthcare, we tend to take a one size fits all approach, right? Uh, everyone gets access to the exact same Medicaid plan, whether or not it meets your needs. But it's also true in education. You can think of those boxes as a curriculum, a medical school curriculum, a public health curriculum. One size fits all. So you can see the guy on the left didn't need it. It's serving the one in the middle pretty well. The guy on the right is still underserved. Whereas in equity, we're not just looking at the process. We're looking at the outcome. And how is it that we can raise all populations to an equitable level of health? Even if that means unique programming, even if that means unique curricula, that's what's needed to be more intelligent about overcoming those challenges. So I've been showing this image for a number of years and someone sent me an image that I think is just brilliant. And the question is, why is that fence there in the first place? And maybe instead of just the package of programs or the curricula to overcome the barriers, let's just get rid of the barriers. And I would put forth that one of our big barriers to achieving American Indian health equity is lack of representation. It's under representation in academics and in leadership. So we're trying to do our part to fix that. Uh, so we have the InMed program. I'm director of that, Indians into Medicine. Uh, we have 11 graduates this year. So we're actually over 250 American Indian physicians coming out of University of North Dakota InMed programming since 1970. Our uh, students completing the second year of medical school are the class of 2023, so they are the 50-year anniversary class of InMed. I mentioned we have an Indigenous Health specialization in our MPH. We also have the new Indigenous Health PhD program. And within the PhD, uh, we were hoping we might have a dozen students in the first cohort. We wound up having 19 students matriculate in the first cohort. And we're going to have 18 students start in the second cohort. So it's really a high demand for this type of programming. Also pleased to announce that we just were awarded an NIH uh, Center Grant a P20 funding mechanism to establish the Indigenous Trauma and Resilience Research Center. We'll, we, we'll be looking at culturally relevant measures of stress and measures of resilience, so focusing on strengths, not just on deficits. Uh, assessing adverse childhood experiences, but also what are the protective effects of cultural connectedness and then even looking at the impact of traditional foods on nutritional epigenetics. So that just started last month, actually, our new Indigenous Trauma and Resilience Research Center. In terms of our PhD program, it is methods heavy, including quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, as well as Indigenous research methods. And the reason is we need more well-trained Indigenous people conducting the research and even asking the right research questions. Lived experience is important. There's no substitute for it. And I think that the, the researchers historically in public health mean well, but they don't know about the commodity food program. They don't even know the right research questions to ask. And that's just one example. So uh, we need cohorts, large cohorts of well-trained indigenous health academics. And that's what we're trying to do about it at UND. It's all offered through Zoom. So this is a picture of one of our classes. We have our indigenous health PhD students all over the US, including one in Maryland, who's a uh, an employee at the Indian Health Service headquarters in Rockville, and one of our students is also from Canada. And just in closing, we're also very pleased with our faculty. We have Indigenous health scholars, and this is one of the best ways to recruit students is to have Indigenous faculty. So in, in addition to myself, Dr. Siobhan Westcott is Athabascan from Alaska, and we have Dr. Melanie Nadu, who is Ojibwe, Dr. Nicole Redbers, who is Dene Nukwe from Northern Territories of Canada, and Dr. Ursula Running Bear, who is Shichangu Lakota, originally from Rosebud, South Dakota. All right, I wanted to leave some time um, for any questions. I know there's a Q&A button, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing here and entertain any questions or comments from the group. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very enlightening talk. The historical perspective that you started with um, really set a frame for me in terms of the, and, and thinking of that together with the epigenetic phenomenon that you also mentioned, um, sort of sets a real frame for why this is a living, ongoing set of issues that are, are not 
going to go away quickly or easily, and they're going to take yet major change with other generational changes. Um, and we need to promote it immediately. We can't wait anymore. I mean, I obviously agree with you. Um, and I think most people in the public health arena who think about what we're all about would agree with you. Um, I, I guess I have a question. Your curriculum is quite interesting. Um, I was that was one of my questions earlier. What's the curriculum like in an indigenous health PhD program or indigenous people's PhD program? How much history is built into that? And where do you cover that? Yeah, so we have a year long course called principles of indigenous health where we cover those types of components. So much of what I talked about here in terms of colonization and its impact. But even also the cultural connectedness to land and language and ceremony and how that is important across many indigenous populations. So we have a principles of indigenous health course. Uh, I also teach the American Indian health policy and indigenous health policy courses. Uh, so those are um, other areas where we can include those components. And then I also teach the indigenous leadership and ethics and thinking about you know, what are the traditional values of indigenous peoples that can be leveraged really to promote health. And uh, so much of it's rooted in communitarianism, not just individual benefit and, and how can we leverage those wonderful values to promote better leadership. Um, but then, of course, we have the research methods, including indigenous research methods, because we've been doing research for millennia, just had different terminology. And we also have courses in public health program evaluation and indigenous evaluation frameworks, because, again, we've been evaluating things forever. We just have different terminology. So I was just very fortunate to have such a wonderful group of faculty members. Who yeah, really. those things. Yeah. yeah, that's probably an unusual, um, unusual to have that many faculty in one place. So I imagine they're pretty well, the few that there are in the public health field are probably distributed pretty widely. Um, yeah. So, you know, you were able to bring that group together or, I mean, you're in a location where there are many people who may gravitate toward it, but nevertheless, uh, I think you've really accomplished a lot there. Um, yeah. We do, we do have some it. questions. Uh, one question was, are there indigenous populations in Europe, Asia, and Africa, and Australia. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, so there are indigenous peoples all over the world. So if we look at human history, at least from genetic analyses, we know that humans started in Africa between one and two million years ago. And over the last 15,000 to 100,000 years, uh, humans have migrated all over the globe. And the original inhabitants of different parts of the earth are the indigenous peoples. So for example, in Northern Europe, the Sami population are indigenous peoples. And if you ever, I didn't include that in this uh, slide deck, but I have a slide that shows uh, my people of Lakota living in teepees, the Sami population lived in teepees, and then the Nenets tribal groups in Northern Siberia and Asia also, also lived in teepees. So three different continents, but a lot of similarities. But yes, we have indigenous peoples worldwide. Okay, question um, about the opioid epidemic. Has the opioid epidemic um, affected American Indian populations as much as non um, Native American Indian populations? Yeah, we, we've been devastated in many of our communities by the opioid epidemic, epidemic and then over prescribing of opiates. And one of our challenges in Many parts of the Indian Health Service is that we don't have the resources for full time staffing. So we get a lot of temporary providers who may or may not have concern about long term impact or continuity of care. So we have seen over prescribing, but we also do see illicit drug use as well. So in some so of our communities, opiates are the big problem, and other communities, methamphetamine is still a big challenge. So we do see what I observe as just tremendous amounts of self-medication of unresolved trauma, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or even food. You know, people are self-medicating unresolved trauma. So that, that's where we really need to intervene, is that it's further upstream. The, the common um, thread is trauma. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I have an interesting question here. Um, 
Yeah, so about language and word choice. Um, language and word choice hold such power. What are some of the subtle and lingering malignancies in our U.S. vocabulary that refer back to indigenous groups in harmful ways? Can you enumerate, list a few of them? I'm sure there are many. Oh, well, certainly. Um... Right there in your neck of the woods, the NFL team and the nation's capital finally changed its name. Um, you know, it, it just just blatant, blatant, overt, unapologetic racism. That's mm -hmm. finally gone away. Um, but I mean, we still see that in other uh, uh, venues. I mean, even, for example, Cleveland Indians with all of the stereotypes associated with that. What if they were the Cleveland Negroes? And what if the the audience were putting on blackface and afros and all the other kinds of stereotypes associated with that, that would just be clearly unacceptable. So it's clearly unacceptable to discriminate against some groups and it's been clearly acceptable to discriminate against American Indians. And this has got to stop. It's just pure racism. But in addition, just even the terminology, the reason we're American Indians is that Columbus thought he was in India. So that's why there's the West Indies. That's why there's you know American Indians is because Columbus was lost at sea. So I've heard a lot of people saying that uh, you know we don't like the word American Indian because of Columbus. So they say they prefer Native American. But the reason this is America is because Amerigo Vespucci, another Italian explorer, named the continent after himself. So in truth, when we're having the argument of American Indian versus Native American, we're trying to actually argue regarding which Italian explorer do we want to pay homage to, Columbus or Vespucci, you know what I mean? So I don't think either term is really great. No. So I prefer indigenous. I think indigenous peoples makes the yeah. most sense. Yeah, and that covers many of the different groups within that. So yes, yeah, so I think I have about, I've only time for a couple more questions. Um, uh, let's see, um, there was one question. Um, I keep getting lost in my screen. Um, ah, this one I think is pretty interesting question. Um, it had to do with your graphic about equality, equity, and liberation. And the question is, what would liberation look like for the indigenous people beyond representation? Very good. And, and actually, one of my friends, uh, her name is Abigail Echohawk. She has a wonderful slide that takes it even one step further. You know, and the question is, when you look at that imagery, um, and again, I, I, it's imagery that I borrowed from other, other sources, but when you look at that imagery, um, it's all males, for one thing. That's not good. And the other consideration is um, they're just watching the game. They're not participating. And the other question is, why does that have to be baseball? You know what I mean? That maybe um, acceptance of different types of cultural practices, but more inclusion of men and women, all genders, but then also inclusion of other types of cultural events. It doesn't have to just be the typical Americana. So I would say for liberation for indigenous peoples would be equity and inclusion. We, we don't have equity. And we're not even included. And I would even ask, you know, thinking about your own curriculum. I'm sure you teach biostatistics and epidemiology. Do you ever use data sets that exclude American Indian data? And I would put forth probably so, because so many times the data is black, white, Hispanic, and other. You know, we're not just other, right? So I'd put forth the academic institutions need to be inclusive of American Indian data. To me, that's part of our steps towards liberation. That's a fascinating perspective and one that I'm sure that many of those that are listening can take away um, in their daily work in the public health programs, epidemiology programs, or wherever they're working. And um, I guess I have a final question, which speaks to the current um, pandemic. And we were talking for a few minutes before the um, talk began about the effect that these, the, um, the early bioterror, the, the bioterrorist, the bio, what is it, biochemical warfare, where we were using smallpox to actually have an effect to uh, eliminate a group. I mean, how does that interact now 
in terms of people's mindsets and histories about being vaccinated because the the um, CDC says we should get vaccinated. I mean, where yeah. where does that go? So what I've observed is that the the uh, populations in my age, I'm, I'm my, in my mid fifties, uh, my pop, my group and older are actually quite accepting of vaccinations because we went through smallpox vaccination. Those of us that have the scar on our arm from the, the smallpox vaccine, right, from the 1970s. So what I've seen is that actually our older populations are more accepting of vaccination because they've seen the benefit. I mean, when they were children, they saw they actually saw polio. You know, I'm a, yeah. you know, as a physician, I never saw polio. I actually never even saw epiglottitis because of the hip vaccine, you know? So we've seen the benefits of vaccinations where we see the big challenges in younger populations who never saw those horrible diseases that are vaccine preventable. So there, there, I think there's less respect for the power of vaccination among younger people. And we're seeing that in, in some of our tribal population, but there is more hesitancy than I wish we had. Fascinating. Well, I think I'm going to close this out um, by saying thank you very, very much for making the time to be with us. Um, I thought the talk was fascinating. I learned a tremendous amount. 